Welcome to Unmasked, a video voyage of all things villain. I'm Fawful's Minion, your alliterating overlord, and this is Majora. <laughs> Some people claim that putting on the mask makes you die faster. Maybe if you pointed to this, most people might understand. That joke dated yet? Oh god, please be dated. Despite getting ratioed by Big Bad Ganon at every turn, there's no stopping the fanfare for Termina's tumultuous terror. The wicked one-hit wonder of its namesake title, Majora's Mask, has vexed the gaming world for generations console generations, and my mere desire of taking just a tiny look closer gave birth to this exciting new series. So, what the hell am I keeping you waiting for? From origin to powers, to drive to feats, which number are you in the gallery of rogues? Join me in hand, this mask's coming off. I feel pretty brave for starting off with a being that challenges every single listed criteria I have, but that's what makes it fun. Come, our battle will be legendary. Majora is a paramount deity of speculative evil. In English terms, you can't cleanly solve him, if it even is a him. I'm no expert in decrypting this mystery, since none even exist, but I have a funny feeling that this mask is a him, and not the kind you want roaming free in a land where gods don't care. Bathed in terrifying ancient myths, Majora's Mask has been canonically chronicled as an artifact of dark tribunal magic for use in unspeakable rituals by an olden cult of, let's call them free thinkers. It seems they eventually thought a little too hard, to the point of overloading the mask with so much dark power that the uninhibited evil tribe actually folded with fear, sealing their beloved rune away to prevent a ruthless cataclysm. Told to us directly by the happy mask salesman, a spiritually murky Hylian man of unknown age and origin. So, it's easy to write this off as an isolated case of magical pranking gone too far. After all, the very nature of Skull Kid, Majora's Mask's most famous wearer, is that of an unstable prankster, an obviously appealing host. Not to mention, having only one major appearance two decades ago, it's built in a way that deliberately deflects deep speculation. Nothing really came of it, so nothing it is, except... No, this story of a rogue tribe turning to dark magic and focusing it into a scary, foreboding, wearable artifact in the name of wicked power is the basis for two Zelda games, Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess, both the two biggest chapters in the forked child era that follows the hero's triumph over the original battle with Ganondorf in Ocarina of Time. That's... A scary coincidence. With all the signs I'm seeing, it's my very confident guess that Majora is the true result of commoners practicing the dark arts. Not to bring it back, but to take it for themselves. The same eternal darkness that every other demon in this series came from. Yeah, like an anti-Triforce. Majora's creepy resemblance to the story of the dark interlopers and the fused shadow is way too close to be foul play. God, see, this is what makes this villain so great. This is only one interpretation of potentially dozens of equal validity. Am I wrong? Are you? Nobody's left to tell us. I personally think Majora's Mask is the original fused shadow, and that the sorceress tribe of dark interlopers are the exact same Hylians that created the facewear out of Genin's primordial essence as a weapon to control the sacred realm themselves. Not as true gods, but wearing them like a mask. This symbolism's making me sick. That would likely make the Happy Mask Salesman the last living member of the very same tribe. A clean explanation for his extensive knowledge on the mask, his disquieting obsession with its power, and possibly as to how the Dark Interlopers actually returned to try the same thing again in Twilight Princess. 
Hell, it's my guess that Majora's Mask wasn't sealed away out of the tribe's fear of impending rampage, but rather the fear of divine persecution and early neutralizing of their precious weapon. Ugh. Although non-canon, the Himikawa manga of Majora's Mask draws the demon's origins parallel with an evil chimera-type creature that feeds on the desires of humans who seek its seemingly wish-granting armor. One traveler discovered that the creature desired death to escape its misery and granted it such, playing strange music to make it dance for three straight days and drop dead from exhaustion. Hmm. And instead of wishing upon the armor, the man carved it into a mask, in hopes of preserving the beast's power, and maybe his wish too. Why do I bring this up? Because y'all would kill me if I didn't. And while it's recognized as illegal ammo for the Zelda cannon, I still think it works. Explains why it ended up as a mask of all things. That happy McMedsplizz over here could have very well been that lone traveler. And its original manner of dying is point for point symbolism for the actual in-game disaster. Almost as if the entity is reflecting its original three day death right back at us. Personalizing our apocalypse as if it was his MySpace page. Silent and undead. I'd say goddamn, but he's already doing that. I'd even buy the idea that the original evil tribe behind the mask's creation were rogue Sheikah, sick of licking the holy boot. You know, you make octopus terminators and mess, you can probably morph Satan into a piece of wood. He's like Plato, that's Satan. I gotta stop this somewhere, cause I'm running into an endless void at this point. I don't wanna see ghosts. Being the surprisingly rare class of villain to literally be the title, and even rarer class of evil clothing, Majora's Mask enforces a ton of its clout by means of massive magical strength. Zelda's only face of evil worth looking at is of the scariest breed of monster in history, the demon. Pulling from likely the same pool of energy that made Ganon a household heel, Majora wields Hyrule's forbidden darkness with dis disturbingly unstable mastery, using the flagship superstition of masks overtaking the wearer as a thematic stand-in for the demon's most famous ability, possession. By far Majora's favorite power, stringing along every being in Termina like a puppet is how it spreads its chaos, only with another classic demon power. Curses. Cursing bystanders like Cafe and the Deku Butler's son, turning them into a child and wooden corpse respectively. Cursing Link to transform into presumably that same Deku. Cursing all four of the land's guardian deities, imprisoning and guarding them with freakish monsters of its own imagination. Of course, none of that imagination went into the names. A bull called Goat? J george a fish named George, hmm, that's not all. Majora's creepy magic allows for all branches of spiritual conjuring, teleportation, levitation, elemental projection, matter manipulation on both a physical and psychological scale. It's easy to guess that just about all the traditional powers of a psychic are at its magically generated fingertips. Safe call considering it speaks telepathically, you wouldn't think something that can make any solid matter do backflips and land on their necks with the simple shine of its eyes would need physical anything, but nah, treat yourself. Buy those dancing legs you've always wanted. Definitely one of the stranger abilities, Majora physically mutates itself in the final battle, sprouting fleshy tentacles, arms, legs, a cycloptic head, a moonwalking Goblin gradually grows into a buff shrieking night terror brute with eye nipples and 20 foot long intestine whips. The fuck? Do drugs, kids. You'll eventually make magic. Though this all pales in comparison to Majora's greatest power of all. 
Take a close look at the events of the game, and you'll notice some disturbing omens. The central world of Termina is nothing more than a reflective manifestation of the Skull Kid's personal views and memories. The giants are his friends who ditched him. The land and its people are exactly that of his home of Hyrule, edited specifically to fit his now lonely, unhinged playtime. It's Majora's grant for the little guy's dark, depression-fueled wish. The Bastard created a world. One that debatably retains a physical form given how profoundly Link experiences it. And you're gonna struggle to believe this, but he made two worlds. Just as Termina stands in for the mask wearer's personal dimension, the moon stands in for the possessor's personal dimension. Hell without a single phantom of order, appropriately asserting absolute rule over those beneath it. That is insane! Where's your alternate realities, Ganon? They on layaway. All this combined with this universal ban from all blinking contests, Majora is the most powerful villain in Zelda history. Unquestionably? Please, this guy's nothing but questions. But yes, I'd say so. And Ganon's got a lot to prove if he wants to argue. But hey, maybe later. So, where's the soft spot? Majora runs the classic demon gamut of being debatably unvanquishable by any mortal might. You're gonna need all the might. Specifically from the three shiny ladies that made the very world he tortures. One thing is consistent. Majora is vulnerable to the power of the goddesses. We never truly see Din, Feror, and Nehru impose on him directly, possibly because he uses his alternate worlds as his own godless hiding place, where they have no true dominion. Thankfully, Majora chose to harass a soldier of their light. Link is legitimately the only thing that stands a chance against him. Even the most basic of proficiency in Link's simplest, organically crafted weapons deals damage to the demon's physical form. Man-made swords bows and arrows, and even shields do good work. Kinda like how holy water is just water without its priest. Specifically, the light arrows make Majora fold, thanks to their raw, divine properties. But because Link is a Triforce wielder, Majora's demon immunity becomes a non-factor, leaving him as more or less a mid-tier dungeon monster. Theoretically, this also implies both Zelda and Ganon could also counter Majora all the same, since they're also Triforce bearers. An interesting thought. Yeah, it sounds as contrived as Achilles' stupid heel, but maybe that was the intent. See, everything changes when you closely study Majora's ultimate canonical weakness. The Fierce Deities Mask. The Fierce Deity Mask is a symbolic supernova being bestowed to Young Link by Majora himself. After aiding every tortured soul within Termina and selflessly giving his quest rewards, the masks, and the power they grant him away to what he sees to be sad lost kids. It's freaky. Why would an all-powerful dark monster further empower his only weakness? Because he sees us as we see him. The bad guy. His utter brooding hatred for Link's heroism and selflessness makes him so spiritually sick. Possibly because nobody ever treated him the same. The manga hits on this hard, with all of the humans seeking the evil beast out for his power and nothing else. So... Could this act of extended suicide, letting Link kill him like it's nothing, be a sign of actual suicidal loneliness? That's so disturbing. I did speculate that this is the result of humans harvesting forbidden darkness, and some people feel that demented stuff every day without killer magic. It's also implied that the Fierce Deity is the wandering traveler that killed Majora in its original form through the magic song who was a god. So Majora could have easily just dressed Link up like that out of sheer spite. Or maybe Link's his reincarnation and the manga's just a scrapped Zelda game in limbo? I don't know man, take your pick. We're all so caught up in asking what is Majora, that we rarely think to ask how is Majora. Or I guess technically, why is Majora? God damn it Drax! So what is it? 
Well, you ever see a car creepily driving by your house slowly? You take out some binoculars to check and there's no driver? Yep, that's a cute way of saying mask very bad! Treating in layers of dramatic revelation for pure primordial shock. Majora's evil drive is so frighteningly primitive, it could legit stir the church. There is no end goal with this demon. Chaos is its game. It will play until there's nothing left. And once there's nothing, it'll just create more. See, that's what happens when unstable humans try to wield primordial umbrage. It gains a mind it'll never find. I mean, this psycho literally made two alternate realities. One filled with vulnerable, suffering people stacked together like a bunk bed just to smash them into each other in a fiery Armageddon. That's deranged. Majora takes the term necessary evil way too damn far and basically assumes the role on a fully spiritual level. Sick. Of course, it's also debatable if Majora's just lonely given the freaky crap that goes down inside the moon and again, the events of the manga, and also the clever detail that he regularly parasitizes others, possibly as some form of psychotic pair bonding. Though, personally, I don't figure this as the basis for its motivation, as all this is too closely themed around Skull Kid's friend conflict. Though, given my interpretation of the Happy Mask Salesman's relationship to the tribe that originally brought Majora to life, and the fact that they intentionally resemble the Freako, the Moon Children might just be a symbolic of their separation, perhaps as Majora's first memory? I don't know. Cut me some slack. But all around, I just enjoy the idea of Majora being so morally rogue. A drifting force most die looking at. Not having to follow the rules, simply because you're too powerful to have to. Okay, this is awkward. All this praise I've been handing out to a handless piece of spooky ass wood is capped off with a ball buster. Because Majora has only had one prominent canon appearance, that being the gaming equivalent of Groundhog Day, where the goddesses of time consensually molest the world rewind button, it puts a fat dent in this villain's resume. The infamous terrible fate that we have all met at least once, you know, obliterating a planet with its own moon. Yeah, not how history remembered it. So, aside from that, which would have been huge, what has Majora accomplished during its one sentient appearance? Let's see, we got created two alternate realities, transformed Link into a Deku scrub and scarred him for life, killed a poor little Deku scrub and no doubt emotionally gutted his now very depressed father, turned a cafe into a child, sabotaging pretty much his whole life, shattered all four of Termina's great fairies into pieces and making us fetch them whole, <laughs> trapped all four of the giants into each of the temples that they guard, created the four temple bosses, monsters of its own imagination, plagued the four regions with their respective curses, pollution, starvation, monsters, and spiritual decay, likely killing many off-screen as a result, terrorized an entire community of residents and in a profound way through the threat of a timed cataclysm, and in a meta sense, scarred many kids and even drove theory-crafting adults insane through its savagely vague profile. In the grand scheme, Majora actually isn't all that accomplished. Its true successes and influences are kept only to a small, albeit loud, crowd, and save for that poor Deku and theoretically some off-screen resonance, Link undid every one of its wrongdoings in less than 80 hours. Ouch. Though the rain was truly terrifying for those affected, and I tremble thinking of everything it could have done if Link failed. Besides, this is only what we know. You could easily imagine tons of horrible things the Freako got away with, and I'd probably believe you. So what the hell? Go nuts! You've met with a terrific foe, haven't you? <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Perhaps the most potent of gaming's one-shot villains, Majora's one for the horror books. With the vicious simplicity in its intents, came some of the most complex feelings from loving gamers. I don't think gaming has ever seen a baddie so cerebral before. Regardless of how I analyzed it, the mask is shaped only to the face that wears it. Almost completely interpretive. Slip it on and live the world it creates for you. That was Unmasked. I'm Fawful's Minion, and you have my thanks. See you next time with Gravity Falls' Bill Cipher. Farewell! <laughs> and now, give it up for the high tier patrons TubaZone 1989, Mailman 019, Kyle Wee 21, Kortamach 437, Egg Zayox, Zay Zandler, Thomas Strury, Sonic Sceptile Warrior, Solitaire Seamus, Skellington 977, Shiro THR, Shining Sil Valley 777, Sefi 90, Roberto Del Fuego, Renaku Lord of Shadow, Put 9 Volt in Smash Bros, please, Peter Shepard, Patrick Sandlin, Panther J, Nathaniel Sterling, Morgan Arvite, Michael Boy, Mathtron 5000, Masal, Justin Bellavo, Maze Arcana, Luke Johnston, Lucario Smash 246, Love, Crocodile King 25, K Dog, Kirby 484, Josie Baird, Jake the Snake Arnstom, JW Goji Fan, Goldsbro TSG, Gavin Glass, Garka 23, Flame Chocobo, Fencer De Rio, Falk You, Emily Infinite, Eddie Toxpin, Diamond Ice, Chibi Emiko, Beast Gamer, BF Rio, Azazel the Undying, Arctic Kaiju, Alfredo Jones, Jobot.11, Antasma Akumu, Eileen Tayasi, GamerFan64, Aiden Johnson, Danger Boat South, Glitch MC, Spencer Studios, The Gag Reflex, Zack Attacker, Muntry, Daniel Lance, Nova Strife, A4X Guy, Nightmare Steel, Crunchy Boy, Burn 100B, Philip Cross, Kairu Shinobi, Alpha Red, Shade 2800, Mitchell Roberts, Augie and Panachu, Anthony Lucero, and Anxiety. May we meet again!